uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. And wherever you are in the world, you are most welcome to today's Petinar. And our special thanks, first of all, to Starlinger for sponsoring this event. Now, today's subject is all about recycling, and this is a subject that we make no apology for returning to. It really is the pressing issue of the day. Greenpeace in the USA has recently got pretty close to calling for plastics to be banned. Now, this may be an extreme position, but it's something that could move towards the mainstream. And within my lifetime, uh, I saw us move away from whale oil to palm oil driven by environmental concerns. OK, we're now concerned about palm oil and the destruction of the rainforest. But this is an illustration of how the unthinkable can actually happen. The packaging industry very much depends on presenting itself as a responsible industry. And recycling is an essential part of that. We need to be able to talk to people and explain how the industry is behaving and what it is doing to stop waste going to landfill, to, to uh, collect post-consumer material and to recycle it for further use. Now, at the moment, a beverage bottle contains on average 17% recycled PET. Our PET in 2025, that must reach 25%. And in 2030, it's got to get up to 30%. Now, I saw yesterday a clip of a congressional hearing from the Senate in the USA, at which the Deputy Secretary for Energy was grilled about how the $13 trillion that he was asking for, or his department was asking for, would reduce climate change, exactly what the impact would be. He waffled. He was simply unable to answer. Now, we must not allow ourselves to be in that position. We must be able to speak authoritatively and knowledgeably about what we're doing. And that brings me to today's panel. And as ever, we have a very knowledgeable group of guests. Casper van den Dungen is Vice President of Plastics Recyclers Europe. He's going to present the latest figures and draw attention to problems and challenges in the RPET market. Paul Need from Starlinger, today's sponsor, is going to talk about the art of recycling and give an insight into new developments in the mechanical recycling process. David Hemberger will focus on changes in pet food grade recycling. And last, but definitely not least, Bruno Longlois of Carbios will talk about unlocking advanced biorecycling of pet and the future of chemical recycling markets. We will have time for questions at the end for everybody except for Casper, who has to leave immediately after giving his, pres his presentation. He has urgent business to attend, and we're very grateful to him for giving us the time and keeping his promise today. Uh, so thank you to Casper in advance. Any questions specifically for him will be sent to him for written response. So don't worry, we will not lose out. Everybody else will be here to take questions at the end. Please submit them via the chat function. Um, please use it, but don't expect it to until the end, uh, to be answered until the end. And now, without further ado, I'm happy to have, hand over to Casper, Casper van den Dungen. Casper, we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, morning, good morning, afternoon or evening. Like he said, I'm just trying to take control. Yes, I have. So I hope you hear me all very well. I see there are a lot of people there. So I have a relatively short presentation and would like to give you an update on today's view where we are and looking at what is coming towards with all those targets we have in front of us. Um, my uh, presentation is about uh, the RPAT supply and demand and an overview. And I hope that after my presentation, we'll be able to give a better view about what we, uh, where we are and where we like to go. Um, in the first um, slide, I have for you uh, a little bit of the vision that we want to make things uh, circular. I think a lot of people are taking this, but uh, that's not an easy thing. It's really a process that we go from linear to circular, and like a circle is never ending. It has so many processes, but they need to better align. And this process, that's, that's something which obviously is uh, a transition process. And that has just been started. And with all the targets which, which are laying years ahead of us, it shows that this uh, transition is um, also taking a lot of time and effort of the whole industry. Um, and yeah, we have to align this by communication. Um, be, having said that, um, I think we all know why we are doing this. 
we need to collect more as was uh, being said. Um, currently, we are a little bit uh, in, if you talk about, uh, that's, that's always the thing about, if you talk about PT, we talk, we used to talk about bottles, but also we have to talk more about trays. In my presentation, I will uh, focus more on the bottles. As for the, the bottles, we have very clear targets. And for the trays, we don't have this recycling content targets, which obviously uh, uh, are maybe coming at a later stage. So in this slide, I want to show you that the, the room for a couple of years ago, and if we're going towards 25, was already said, and 29, we have to go to a collection system of 77 to 90%. Um, this being done already by partly uh, the US system, the uh, deposit return systems, 13 member states countries have this already actively today, then have decided it, and I will come back to it later on my slides, um, that's also a long process of transition to get those uh, DRS systems and those collection systems onto this very high level of, of returns, and, and timing is in, in some cases very uncertain. So that we will come up with a maximum of 23 by the uh, end of 25, we will see. Uh, then still we, we have uh, eight remaining uh, member states which have not yet uh, really decided. And I have to say that are very important uh, countries because it includes uh, France and Italy and, and Spain, and that are pretty big volumes uh, for our uh, markets to understand uh, if we can collect uh, with via a DRS system or not, because it normally gives this high returns on collection. Um, and then, um, okay, the, 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 the sorting uh, for the recycling rates, um, is something that, that also needs to be found out, but that's also at a very high level of, of return. Having said, I want to visualize going for the next slide. Uh, this overview is in color, a little bit what I've said before. Um, you see the blue uh, countries on Europe where we already have this active uh, DRS systems, and you see the green which are in the process of in trying to, to make it work and to decide to do that. Um, and if you take the line, the timeline of 25, um, that's if I see those, this presentation or this 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 picture is is shown by uh, and uh, I've taken and uh, consult with Tomra this 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 data um, is being re-updated every year, and you see that sometimes the activation on when it is expected that it is always a little bit in delayed. You normally talk about two years, and it's 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 it's. Uh, in principle, an expensive system, but a lot of people are involved, and that's why this transition to organize everybody to align when are the machines installed, what is the, 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 the quota we want to get at, how, what's the levy we want to pay, is the recycling capacity available, do we make it circular direct, etc., etc. That's a lot of a transition and communication which is taking apart. And in the red countries, like I said before, these are the big countries which also need to be uh, fine-tuned and they are a little bit uncertain for this moment in time. So looking to 25, it's going to be a question if we will have enough um, for, uh, uh, for the total of Europe. Definitely looking at uh, the picture like you see it today, it will be more on one uh, country than uh, in the other country. And this is where, where also something you need to prepare if there is not the collection in place and the demand is very high, then we need to export it and lever it out to all the other countries. So for my next slide, um, I'm going through the, the uh, evaluation on the uh, on the capacities because if we have the collection uh, fine tuned, then we just have to make sure that we can process it. Uh, in this slide, we have the intimation, uh, anticipation on on the uh, on the the share of our pet we're going to take into the market. Um, and if I look to the last uh, column of this slide, you see that 2030. Um, we, we probably uh, will have, uh, let's say, 3.8 million tons uh, bottles going into the market, taking 3 million tons back. And out of that, there will be an indication on what could be the share of the RPET which we um, could use. And that's a little bit of an issue that if there is a dedication on the, um, let's say, the targets being to daily known as 30% in 2030, 
uh, you all see a lot of bottles today already with 100%, with 50%, with, with, with 30%. It's a little bit uh, uh, chicken and the egg situation. Um, in this transition process, uh, people like to understand if it's possible to do it uh, mechanically with 100%. I think we have proven right now that, it, that it's working very okay. But there is a limitation uh, long term. There is the anticipation of the industry that uh, for the mechanical recycling would, would like to to stay at a stable stage of 70 percent and the complementary uh, processes of uh, chemical recycling uh, can uh, contribute to another 30 percent to keep the circularity going long term. But when we're going to start with that and how it is going to evaluate, that's all to be seen in the future, because that's something which the market players had to decide on and has to be facilitated by the circularity process in each of the individual countries. Um, already said before that Tray is uh, also part of the PT value chain, and there in the past there was a lot of material already uh, consumed that the bottles which were recycled were partly going in an open loop to another application called Tray's. Now we see that there is a, a large development on the tray um, uh, collection as well as reprocessing and reuse in that uh, scenario. But the question is always uh, in supply and demand. If it's not quite clear what we want to have as a percentage, there will be an interaction with all those different markets of PET to maybe absorb some potential uh, quantities on that. Um, and um, in this scenario, uh, my main contribution to the discussion would be to say, OK, where are we in 2020 and where or in 2030? You see with the graphs of the yellow uh, uh, developing from, uh, from 1.6 to 3 million tons, potentially uh, there is still a lot of improvement that extra capacities are needed. It's only the question uh, for everybody in the room to take a decision on when to install and to expand on this capacity. The pipelines of the supply chain are, as I said before, collection, installing uh, wash lines or repellentizing lines can take up to two years. Uh, from, from different cases, uh, one year uh, is the best case of scenario. So we have to think a lot ahead about what we think we have to do with the market. Today, um, in the summary of this uh, part, is that uh, mechanically is, is the, the normality today. Um, but the chemical uh, recycling is in the pipeline and we have a good uh, vision that this will also be very complementary to uh, the potential uh, which is needed uh, by uh, by the market. Uh, having said that, is that uh, going to focus on my next slide is that we see a lot of import materials uh, already in the market. And that's a little bit of a, if you want to make something circular, um, yeah. If you get an import is the, the third dimension on the other side of the world, we see that we like to incorporate a lot of material. If supply demand is not there, then it will take a, a lot of volume into uh, our industry. And with the next slide, I'm trying to show you that only um, the, the, the price effect which were there, we, we have really uh, gone to a bumpy road. If you can see from this graph, it's really a very uh, increase in prices where the two the three graphs you see here is uh, the development uh, of the price over a period of uh, 2020 to the end of uh, 2022 um, and then for uh, the, the the clear material um, as well as the colored material as well as uh, the repellentized material uh, the repellentized being the highest material uh, which at uh, the middle of last year declined with the arrow indicated to a downwards pressure, uh, which went very fast. And uh, we think it's it's a major cause is by uh, huge imports, which were uh, also uh, up to, let's say, one third of the total consumption of PET, which obviously have a big influence in, uh, in, the, in supply demand chain. Uh, which then um, yeah, will, will, will give uh, different prices. The different prices, we get different scenarios of investments um, and it, it, it will jeopardize a little bit of the uh, stability which we try to create with circularity. And that's something which is important, uh, which we need to see if we want to do an investment, what is the uh, requirement and at what prices can we uh, uh, 
sell our material. In this price, it, I think for the most people interested with uh, PET, they are aware that there has been over the past years a very large premium on the RPAT into the market. Uh, but with today's development since last year's, we see a tremendous drop of the, the price pressure and we have not seen yet uh, of that's something to, to look in the crystal ball uh, where the, the prices will, uh, will go for. And therefore, it's also important to understand for the collection what the contribution will be for the financing of uh, enlarging these collection uh, systems. Um, then uh, to summarize, maybe, um, as I said, with the colors of Europe, uh, the transition of the different uh, let's say uh, collections in each countries. I have to say that also designed for recycling is not yet there for all the bottles available. I mean, and therefore there are some still processes uh, to change labels or to change caps or coatings or, or whatever they have. There is, uh, there still need to be some triggering in some uh, some applications to improve uh, the circularity uh, process and to improve the validation, which is going to come uh, by the legislation to classify the recyclability of each of our products into the market. Um, to, to give also a summary about what is the collection rates in the different countries, it can be as low as 20%, but as high as, seven, as 90%. So this means that, that each stage of the circularity, which I'm trying to say, is, is different. The designs are not there for all of them. There are the range in collections, also the wash capacity. We have countries where there is an overcapacity uh, as an undercapacity in supply demand that they are a full exporter of the bills or a large importer of the bills. We have food grade contamination capacities which are also oversupplied and undersupplied. We have uh, chemical recycling which is under development uh, but uh, it's going to come pretty relatively soon, 25, I think. Uh, it's also an important to face now for the industry to understand what is really chemical recycling, what is novel technologies with all the legislation coming, um, what can we claim, what can we not claim, that are all transition points which are different per country. Um, recycling content, as I said before, there are still bottles which are 100% virgin and they are 100% uh, mechanically recycled uh, content. Um, to calculate the 25%, there are a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, proposals and even the package packaging waste regulation is trying to push uh, for some changes. We will only find out uh, by, uh, I hopefully, uh, May next year that we finally uh, can know if it has to be by SKU or by, by country. That are important things which we have to visualize for ourselves with all the triggers and the targets we have set in front of us. And then the average recycling content, if you say we are trying to recycle something in a certain country, there are countries which have a low recycling content per bottle, which is averaged out on, on 10%, but there are also countries which are long time uh, recycling and uh, circularity promoting, and they are uh, as high as 50%. So saying all those details, um, it's maybe giving you the indication that each country has its own transition program. Uh, to fulfill the targets in each of that countries. And that's the main message I want to give in this presentation is that we have to look uh, for every country, what is needed, which phase of the circle is not perfect, where we need to do the capacities or the collections or the design for recycling. And that's something you have to find out for yourself if you want to individualize your development in this each of those countries. Knowing, knowing this, um, I made a, a summary sh sheet um, is the previous or the last, almost last slide of my presentation. And that, that's the challenges which we have. It's all interactive. As I said, the country approach, I think, is, is the main triggerer in, in making the, the turns developing. You have the DRS, where I said that, OK, so there, there are still 10 countries to develop. Um, then it, there is the markets, are they going to grow further than 25% and, and stay at 100 or go down to 80% in some countries? Um, there is the, the RPAT in general, if it comes in or if we're going to make it all from here. Um, the technologies, I think you will learn from the next presentations that there are a lot of things which are suggested uh, to, to improve uh, the uh, 
the requirements for this circularity to really go to very high uh, levels of recycling content. I think PET is a very nice material to cope with that. Um, and then in uh, one of the last uh, triggerings is the, is the le legal uh, development. We everybody was waiting on this ring run run numbers, which uh, actually went uh, to market uh, last week. So everybody now has a preview about how this work with the numberification and the, 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 the DOCs, which uh, are now required by the law to come. Uh, but there is more in the pipeline to come because there are pretty much uh, uh, not into the stream of the comp of the company's wishes to have the numbers uh, all, all uh, already published. I think we still have some some numbers to to be uh, to be coming into the market, but I think they're working very strong on to facilitate that and to transparent that in the in this market. So uh, with that, I would like to to come to the end of my presentation. Um, in, in giving the clear message that it is a very challenging way. We have targets ahead of, uh, ahead of us. We have for capacity, which we are requiring because, and we have also uh, a lot of situations which are very unique in each of the countries, whether it's the collection, the requirements or the, the technologies. Um, so we really have to balance uh, uh, or our actions all together to boost the investments where required. So with that, um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations. I'm sorry I cannot contribute to the participation of question and answers, but I'm surely that you're in good hands for the rest of the day. Thanks very much and hope to see you all. Bye bye. Jasper, thanks very much indeed uh, for an interesting question. Uh, sorry, an interesting session and insight into what's happening with the capacity uh, for recycling in Europe. Uh, it looks like it's growing rapidly, with some exceptions, including the UK, sadly. Uh, and it's strange that the deposit return scheme is floundering a bit, or seems to be floundering a bit. We've got experience of that in Scotland, but fingers crossed it will get better as we go along. Thank you again, and sorry we won't we won't be seeing you anymore, but it's been an excellent presentation. Now we're going to Paul Needle, who's from Starlinger, today's sponsor. He is going to talk about the art of recycling and give an insight into new developments in the mechanical recycling process. Paul is head of recycling technology at Starlinger & Co, which is a, an Austrian company headquartered in Vienna. He has been with Starlinger since 1999, so he's a real veteran, 24 years. He was appointed to his current position, the commercial head of Starlinger Recycling Technology, with responsibilities for sales, marketing, finance and legal matters in 2017. So he's had plenty of time to get his feet under the table. Paul, over to you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Don't forget to unmute your microphone. Thank you, Rory, for the um, for the um, introduction. Um, nice to be here. Uh, welcome everybody to my presentation. Um, we are one of the uh, the sort of head sponsor today, and but I try to make the presentation not a pure sales pitch. I try to uh, give uh, our insight from Stalinger about the market and about the challenges. And um, before I do so, I would like to give a very brief uh, introduction of, uh, of our company, Starlinger, the company I work for. Uh, we are a family owned company founded uh, way back in 1835. Uh, we, all we do is equipment supply, equipment for the uh, plastic uh, packaging and plastic recycling industry. So uh, we make a um, the business unit I work for, we make uh, mechanical recycling lines and we've been doing that for quite a bit of time. So we started in 1987 with the first line. And since this is a PT presentation, I am um, giving you only the PT numbers. So as of uh, January 2023, we have a uh, total installed capacity of 2 million tons per year. Uh, for PT and polyester, whereas the lion's share would say 80 to 90 percent out of that is uh, PT bottle to bottle recycling. We've been doing that for quite some time now. Uh, the first uh, letter of non-objection for bottle to bottle recycling we received back in uh, 2004. Here is a, a brief overview of, um, of the technology that we offer, what we can bring to the table um, in terms of uh, PT recycling. We make uh, sheet lines for a thermoforming sheet. 
we make um, pelletizing lines for fibers and filament, uh, but we also do um, machines for super sacks. We can make the super sacks not only out of polypropylene, but also of um, PT nowadays, which is interesting because we can internally close the loop. So the customers we have on the textile side of our business, they can return the, the, um, the bags, the PT bags, and we can make um, new PT bags and fabric out of it. Speaking about food grade RPET, uh, that's an overview of the uh, technology for, for food grade. We make uh, machines for flake to food grade flake, which is normally used in front of a sheet line. <clears throat> Can also be used, of course, in front of injection molding machine. We uh, make uh, flake to food grade melt machines, but the majority that we do is flake to pellet. So um, pelletizing machines, flake in, pellet out, and with this pellet, you can make uh, a new bottle, a new preform at a rate of uh, at a rate of 100%. Uh, so this is what I'm going to speak mainly about today, about uh, PT bottle to bottle recycling. And I think it's quite interesting the um, the market dynamics that we're in nowadays. I've shared here on this on this slide and uh, an overview of what's going on in the world. Uh, since we're uh, an Austrian company uh, on, on the top, I, I, I put the numbers from the from the European Union. We have the famous single use plastics directive, which is already a national law for quite a bit of time since July 2021. And um, here we have a 25% a ARPET target in each bottle by 2025, and that even goes up to 30%. Um, the European Union is going to extend that very soon uh, with the uh, revision of the packaging packaging waste regulation so we expect roughly second quarter third quarter of 2024 to come that uh, the the new regulation to come into force and then we are going to see because the documents that were leaked already we can see that uh, the arpet uh, inclusion rate is even going up uh, going to be higher than now uh, but that's not all we're also going to see um uh, recycling content mandates in um, in other polymers such as uh, polyethylene and polypropylene and other packaging polymers. Elsewhere in the world, there's also a lot going on. Um, in the US, for instance, in California, we have a, a minimum recycling content mandate. Currently, 15% goes up to 50% by 2050. India is a very dynamic market at the moment. Um, they do have a mandate for 10% um, flexible and 30% enriches, and last but not least, the Emirates. Um, it's expected to have 35% uh, ARPET content. So that's really very interesting because uh, if you've been in, in, in recycling and PT recycling for, uh, for quite a bit of a time, uh, things like that were unthinkable, like maybe five, 10 years ago. I mean, we had um, the first thing we, the first thing we saw was um, um, targets for for recycling but there were never any target on the other hand which is a reuse target a minimum recycling content mandate so that's that's really interesting what's going on in the in the world at the moment other than the the, the legislation which uh, was shown in the previous slide we of course also have uh, pledges so uh, voluntary pledges of the industry the uh, circular plastic alliance for instance um, this is an uh, industry-wide association that came up with the target of reusing 10 million tons of ARPET, not only ARPET, excuse me, of plastic, in new products by 2025. And the big players of the uh, fast-moving consumer goods, the big four, such as uh, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Nestle, and Danone, they also have their individual recycling targets. And um, if you look at the third line, it says recycling targets here. So you can see most of them also have 25% by 2025. And you can imagine what this is doing to the market. Yeah? So you have the, the big brands that have their own pledges, but you also have legislation. And you have, of course, the consumer that is demanding recycled content in, uh, in each product they are buying in the supermarket. And that, that's the reason why the whole recycling industry is, is truly booming these days. But of course, we also have challenges. Um, we have challenges to overcome. Um, speaking about uh, PT, for instance, uh, from my point of view, I think one of the most um, important uh, critical success factors is um, 
to make sure you have enough capacity, enough quantity of flake coming in, but also the right quality. This is truly different than uh, being a, a traditional uh, plastics converter. If, for instance, if you're buying from company A, from one petrochemical company today, you might not like the price, so you're going to buy for, from company B or company C the other day. You always have material available. In recycling, that's not the case. In recycling, you really have to make sure before you invest that you have uh, uh, enough quantity of flake available uh, for on the long run, on the long term, but also, of course, the right quality, because the washing quality also is very truly important and determines to some extent then also the the quality that we get and what we can do from the flake to turn it into pellet and the quality that we are expecting then at the end of the process. We have um, another hurdle which I think is interesting to, to speak about is uh, food contact. <clears throat> we have here um, uh, different food contact regulations, which I'm going to show in a little more detail on the next slide. So uh, in the European Union, it's 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 pretty clear what's going on. We have the EFSA regulation. So um, Europe is a highly um, regulated market in general in terms of um, you know, lawmaking policies, but in other parts of the world, there is um, maybe no law at all about um, RPET. If you're allowed to use ARPET in new products, and uh, in some countries even they 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 prohi prohibit it. It's not allowed. Yeah, so you really have to make sure, um, depending where you are in the world, what is the situation. Yeah, and also Europe is not is not always the safe haven. Yeah, because uh, uh, EFSA changed the regulation uh, last fall in um, September October, which makes it now more difficult for recyclers outside of the European Union to sell the product into the European Union. Other than the, the national, the country specific rules to consider, uh, you also have the brand owner approvals. So to have an, uh, an EFSA um, positive opinion in Europe or an FDA from the United States is one thing, but to have uh, uh, the blessing from the brand owners that allow you to, to sell into the, the chain, that's another thing. And um, each of these four companies I mentioned before with their recycling targets, they have their own individual rules. Um, what they all have in common is, um, in first place, uh, you have to uh, operate with uh, uh, recycling equipment that has, uh, um, has been approved by them in the past. But other than that, they're also, of course, going to come to, to audit your facility. So um, national rule is one thing, but brand owner rules is also the other thing. And um, last but not least, uh, what I would like to mention on this slide, um, when you compare, for instance, the um, the FDA letters of non-objections, there are also very large differences, because um, if you're not going to dig inside, you're not going to find out um, what's the allowed um, rate, at what rate you can really use the, the pellets back uh, into new, new bottles and new preforms, and this is uh, determined by the super cleaning technology that you're using. And I here can proudly say that all the various FDA LNOs that Starling has in place, uh, all of them produce RPET, which can be re reused in, in the percentage of 100% back into um, preforms and bottles. And now I would like to speak uh, a little bit more uh, about the um, our technology for uh, PET bottle to bottle recycling. We have uh, introduced last fall, uh, it was um, the market launch was actually at the Casio, um, new technology for bottle to bottle recycling. We have been uh, doing bottle to bottle recycling for quite some time. So um, we sold the first machine in 2005, so uh, almost 20 years. <clears throat> And um, we've been doing that very successfully all these years, but um, we thought after all this time, it's uh, it's, it's also high time to 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 rethink the, um, the the technology that we are offering. And what I can tell you is, basically, the the base principle hasn't changed. So we are still um, uh, properly drying the flake first, 
Then we introduce it into a single screw extruder that also stays the same. We palletize it, and then we solid state the pallet. But how we are going to do it nowadays with the new machine, this is very different compared to before. Yeah? So um, in, the, in, the, in the engineering phase that started about three years ago, we really looked at each individual machine module and we thought like, how can we think make things uh, different? How can we make things in a way um, which is more cost effective for our customers that are operating the equipment? And uh, the biggest changes actually were uh, in the front end on the dryer. So um, instead of two dryers, we're using now a single stage dryer with uh, um, a very um, new and unique approach um, to create um, desiccant air. We are using nowadays a short extruder without venting unit uh, with a melt pump. This is also a, a, a big difference. And there have been significant changes on the SSP at the back end of the machine with um, extended um, um, residence times and um, capacities and sizes. And also um, uh, we made it more uh, energy efficient. So um, this is an, um, a picture of the, of the, of the new machine <clears throat> that we have already in the market running successfully. Typically, the, um, the quality that you expect from um, recycled PT um, to go back into a preform has to be absolutely comparable with uh, virgin material. So the magical numbers here are uh, acetaldehyde, maximum 1 ppm, 40% uh, crystallinity, uh, color values, L value, typically around 70 B value between minus 2 and plus 2. And um, of course, um, IV is adjustable, um, pellet weight is adjustable, depending on the um, on the requirement that your customers have. The next three slides uh, are just dealing with a couple of um, online um, modules of the machine. I'm, I only have a 15 minutes uh, speaking slot, so I cannot introduce the complete machine in details to you. But I thought maybe those things are interesting um, to share. Uh, here on the slide, you see the human machine interface, the operation panel. Uh, our panel is um, is operating um, with uh, RFID technology, so um, uh, we are no longer using passwords. Um, so um, the operator or the foreman or the, the 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 operations manager, they all have the individual chips. So uh, when you change something or you want to change something in the on the setting of the machine, you have to log in with your individual chip and then it's um, recorded in the system who you are and what kind of changes you do, which is always important for for night shift. Um, other than that, um, there's a data logger included uh, where we are monitoring and uh, recording the 40 most relevant uh, process data. This is very important for the food grade traceability uh, because um, in most of the regulations, no matter if they're national or, or brand regulations, you will have an auditor coming in by time to time. And they, of course, want to see over the days, months and years uh, the food safety relevant parameters. And um, we're making sure with the, the panel that we're operating that this is always available. We have an uh, inland viscosimeter on the machine. This is a, a very handy tool to give you a very early indication if something changes. Um, we are in the recycling business. That means um, the uh, the input material can change if you use a different source. Um, and for instance, if you see a, a change in, uh, in viscosity on the process, um, you see it very early in the process and you have to change uh, you have the chance to to react quickly um, compared to having um, to measure only the the chip at the at the, at the SSP at the at the end of the process. Um, here we have an online color measurement. The same idea, like for the uh, IV measurement, we would like we are we want to do this online because uh, we want to have a very clear indication if something changes. So uh, in, with this uh, piece of equipment, we can even have a, a feedback loop to the front end of the machine where we typically have a, uh, a additive unit sitting 
that can add toner to the material. So in, if we see something changes with the input material, we can immediately react. Or let's say the machine reacts automatically and changes the, um, um, the addition of the toner. Last but not least about the uh, machinery slides of automatic food grade monitoring, which is probably the most important thing. So um, the machine has XYZ number of uh, food grade re relevant parameters, such as residence times, vacuum levels, uh, temperature. And um, if you press this EFSA FDA button on, then the machine automatically monitors all these parameters. And in case one of these parameters, only one of them is out of spec, the material will be automatically diverted. So uh, you can really make sure that you, uh, the, the material that you produce is always 100% food safe and you always protect your brand and uh, finally the consumers. So this is probably the, I would say, the most important thing about the whole technology. What are the achievements of the, uh, of the new equipment compared to our conventional equipment? With our new PT art system, we were able to uh, um, improve the output by 15%. While that, we were able to uh, reduce the maintenance requirement on the machine by uh, 46 percent, very big number. We reduced the, uh, the energy, energy consumption by 25 percent. And uh, the machine is also quite compact, so we um, reduced the footprint by um, 21 percent. And all of that without compromising anything on the um, chip quality. Here's a comparison of the um, of our conventional system. It's the one uh, on the bottom, the IV Plus, with our new system. The one on the top, the Art. So we produce the same uh, from the same plate. We produce the same um, IV. And um, you see, the L value is, is totally comparable. And on the new equipment, the B value is much better than on the uh, conventional equipment. But even without the addition of of additives, VOCs. Um, this is uh, also an um, uh, example from one of the various tests we have uh, conducted. Uh, I mentioned a couple of slides earlier that the, the magical number for acetaldehyde is, is 1 ppm. So in this case, we achieved uh, 0 0.7, way below, with um, benzene levels of uh, 20 and uh, lemonine levels of uh, also 20. So um, this brings me to the uh, end of my presentation. My understanding is that uh, we will have a question and answer session at the end after my two fellow speakers. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, good luck to my fellow speakers uh, with their presentation and I'm available for, for your questions at the end of, of, of the session. Thanks, Paul. That was a pretty thorough overview. Uh, much appreciated. And yes, we look forward to you. Um, joining us and, and answering some questions at, at the end. Now we're going on to David Heckenberger, who is Product Manager, PET, at NGR. Uh, he has been specialising in liquid state polygon, polycondensation for pet recycling for many years, more than I have fingers, I can tell you. His expertise and strategic mindset has enabled him to lead the commercialization and further development of cutting edge machines, providing valuable insights into the latest advancements and challenges the plastics industry faces. And he's going to be focusing on changes in pet food grade recycling uh, and very much looking forward to hearing from you, David. Over to you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Roy, for a uh, very nice introduction. Thank you also to uh, uh, Paul and Casper for the good presentation before. Uh, it's a pleasure for me today uh, to discuss with you the challenges in PAT food grade recycling and what the LSP technology from NGR can help in some of that uh, matter. Uh, this discussion I have prepared with some slides which corresponds to uh, my ideas. So I hope you will uh, find the presentation interesting. So I have to take over for oh, the presentation. Yeah. So yeah, PAT, why PAT? I see PAT is the material for now and for the future, especially uh, 
in, in the packaging industry because of its uh, recyclability. Yeah, it has a so big uh, a range of application in, in the food packaging as well in the technical application in, uh, in fiber and textile application. Uh, also for Thai code and really uh, a very, very uh, tough applications. Yeah? It is very easy for recycling, washing and sorting. The me mechanical recycling technologies are available already for a long time, but we hit before also. Uh, it is a uh, state of the art to recycle PET for food grade. It is approved by FDA and EFSA and is accepted by the brand owners also for 100% food safety for 100% reuse in the packaging. Yeah, I would like to give you a very quick update about uh, our company NGR, where we are and what we are doing and what is uh, in which segments we are working. Uh, right now, more than 200 uh, employees are working for NGR for a better future uh, for the passion of, of plastic recycling. Uh, we have currently a turnover of about uh, 96 million euro with about 1,450 installed lines in, in 90 countries. For sure, not of all of them are in the in the PAT segment. Uh, NGR, to be honest, is very young in the PAT segment. We started in 2000, uh, 2013 with our first LSP technology for fiber application, and then we grow uh, step by step, step into the the food application in 2016 for in the in the sheet application and 2018 in the bottle to bottle uh, application. Uh, the company NGR is is uh, part of the next generation group, and the next generation group is uh, owned by two private people, and the Inca Group Inca is the investment group of IKEA. And uh, except of uh, NGR, there's NG NGE, Next Generation Elements, in this group. NGE produce pyrolysing systems. Uh, sorry, I forgot to. Uh, so here, here we are. NGE produce pyrolysing systems uh, for, let's say, non recyclable uh, materials in order to produce uh, gas or oil. Then we have the company Next Generation Analytics in the group with the company Colin and Britas. Colin produced the uh, pilot lines, multi inspection systems, multi-filament system, and they are very strong also uh, in the medical market of their products. The company Britas are a manufacturer for uh, automatic uh, Belt melt filters and as well continuous and discontinuous uh, piston screen changing. We in the uh, NGR, our headquarter is uh, located nearby Linz in Upper Austria, and we have a um, uh, sales and test center as well in the US nearby of Atlanta, and a service team as well, uh, a sales team in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. Yeah? Our products at uh, NGR, uh, we are working mainly in the segment uh, post-industry recycling, post-consumer recycling and PRT improvement. In the post-industry recycling, uh, our main machines are here, the single shaft shredder systems connected directly with a single screw extruder where you can run uh, all kind of uh, polyolefins, polyoesters, uh, through the shredder, shred them and extrude them in one step uh, and finally, finally pelletize and venting uh, the, the melt. Yeah. Uh, in the post-consumer sector, we are using uh, special machines which they can handle then uh, higher moisture, higher printed material and so on. And we have here, for example, cutter densifier to reduce the moisture or um, or uh, also this um, F-Gram uh, combination with the extruder. In the PAT improvement, as I said, and what we will discuss mainly today, we are in the market uh, since 2014, where our first applications were in the in the fiber business. 
And then we started in, in sheet and bottle to bottle recycling. On the next slides, you see already the flexibility. So the LSP reactor uh, can process with uh, all kinds of different PET input materials. Yeah, you can put in uh, fiber material, bottle flakes, sheet flakes, and and other uh, PET materials. Uh, and in the future, we are also uh, develop the LSP reactor for uh, food grade recycling in terms of uh, high impact polystyrene, polypropylene. Of course, by uh, consideration the novel technology. We have done already very successful uh, tests to make the uh, post-consumer uh, polystyrene also uh, food gradable. Yeah. Uh, in this slide, you see, uh, depending on the input material, you can use a uh, shredder feeder extruder combination or all other kinds of input uh, in, uh, shredder or extruder depending on the input material. Today we are focusing more on bottle to bottle recycling. That's why I have marked the dryer and the extruder. Then we are going with this concept over the decontamination process uh, through our LSP reactor. In the LSP reactor, we decontaminate the material. We lift the viscosity. We build up enough pressure and we take care that the that the throughput is very constant. Uh, and this all is done within uh, about 30 minutes in the reactor. And after that, you are very flexible because of the con uh, constant uh, melt quality. You can go in pelletizing or in several inline applications like fiber, sheet, strapping, or finally also you can use the LSP reactor directly in front of an injection molding machine in order uh, to reduce uh, energy consumption in order to save investment and material log logistics. Yeah, uh, today, as I, uh, the main topic is the challenges in PET recycling, and I put my own uh, 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 let's say challenges. What I think in the, is is challenging this market uh, on this slide, and uh, as already we heard in the presentations before, the quality stability coming from import export is a topic. So when we tested the materials in the past from a European company, we was quite sure that the materials come from uh, uh, Europe. Right now, you never know from where the material is really coming. And this leads to instability in uh, in terms of uh, the quality, the contamination, the bulk density, the humidity. Humidity is also influenced by storage and transporting. Yeah, and with uh, our machines, for sure, we have to take care on this on these matters, and we have to handle this. Another challenge is for sure also the uh, price situation, especially. Uh, the price difference, what we currently have between Virgin uh, and the RPET pellets. And further, we have the uh, bottle flakes collection rate and the availability of the bottle flakes, what we already also uh, heard in the past presentation. I would like to start with. Uh, with the impurity effects on the RPET quality. So when you take a look to the uh, first contam contaminants like polystyrene, polypropylene, PLA, EVOH, PE and nylon, these types mainly have an impact on the color on yellowing. Another impact is to have a faster IV drop in the extruder and they lower the IV increase in the polycondensation process. So this, uh, some of this also leads, leads to a haze effect, to a discoloration, yeah? uh, but has uh, this uh, contaminants do not have an influence on the health. So it's more a, a mechanical and uh, 
property issue. Uh, on the following slides, I would like to take a more focus to the contaminations like glue, PVC and polycarbonate because uh, these impurities, in my opinion, uh, has a, a negative influence on the human health and therefore we really have to take care also to um, widely uh, reduce this contamination in, in the bottle flakes. PVC, for example, leads during the um, uh, during the extrusion process to benzene formation. Yeah. Uh, it has PVC has a big impact on discoloration as well on the IV behavior in the extruder and in the uh, polycondensation process. Polycarbonate is not that well uh, analyzed, but it seems that it has an influence on building uh, bisphenol A also in the extrusion process. I would like to give you now an example what came uh, uh, to us, what, what we have to deal with, uh, with our machines. Uh, that's an example from typical pellets what we have in uh, South America. We analyzed them by roasting test, optionally also by flake, uh, infrared flake sorter tests. So they are also very uh, good equipment on the market, what can be used uh, also in the lab. Uh, in this case, there was an, uh, we detected a, uh, a ben, uh, PVC of 72 ppm, but is quite high and uh, on the on the upper upper limit let's say some of the brand owners uh, do not allow this already this this uh, this high uh, volume of pvc but uh, because of the excellent cleaning performance then also in the liquid states uh, polycondensation we came up to a very low benzene value of only eight parts per billion so when we take a look to the to the low uh, benzene value, it's always uh, necessary to have a comparison what you put in and what you get get out then, because the benzene is mainly uh, related to the PVC content. A second, uh, very quickly example is another uh, pellets what we have here analyzed in Europe, uh, the PVC content only uh, or uh, 27 ppm. We for sure have also analyzed some glue, uh, polyamides and yellow flakes. Uh, the weight of these flakes, uh, we have to consider here that they are measured including the flakes. So it's not only the glue what we measured here on the weight, it's glue and, and uh, sticking on the flake. Yeah. Uh, the result here is, uh, unfortunately I have it here in, in PPM, it's 2.4 parts per billion, so really on the on the very very uh, low uh, detection limit. But this, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. But the, this result uh, fits excellent to uh, to that what we what we found in our test center. We did a test with Virgin PRT and we uh, purposely add uh, PVC in order to find out what is the uh, performance of the liquid state polycondensation. And as you can see in the picture, we add, uh, we add here uh, 25 uh, ppm, we add 50 ppm and we add 100 uh, ppm on PVC into virgin material and we found out with 50 ppm, uh, less than 10 uh, parts per billion on benzene in the pellets. Uh, so this is really way lower as what uh, the brand owner uh, allow. The lowest brand owner specification what I know is 30 uh, ppb in the pellets and some others specify between 80 and 100 parts per billion. But this is, in my opinion, or only the half story of uh, benzene because we have to take care of the final product and this is in that case it's our bottle from where we uh, finally uh, drink and, and consume the water and there's an additional risk 
when you produce uh, from the pellets a uh, preform because this uh, we have to uh, consider an additional uh, increase of benzene in the preform production. So if the benzene is very low in the pellets, the chains to have a low benzene increase in the uh, injection molding process is, is, is very good. If the uh, benzene value in the pellets is already very high in the range of 40 or 50, uh, then you can have a couple of hundreds in the in the pellets. Yeah. In the preform, sorry. On a BPA, that's another story. What is not so well uh, analyzed uh, so far? From our side, we have uh, a few data already. Uh, for ex uh, what makes it more difficult in BPA is we uh, it's not 100% sure from where BPA is all coming from. It's maybe coming from polycarbonate for sure. It's coming from glue, but then it's depending from what is glue made of. Is it a water-based glue? Is it a carbon? Uh, is it a epoxy? hearts based glue yeah, so all this can have influence on building bpa in the extrusion process but also here is good when you have a, a, a good cleaning efficiency in the recycling process in order to minimize bpa in the pellets and we found here uh, uh, some number with one number was 0 0.09 uh, ppm what means 90 uh, parts per billion, yeah. uh, we definitely would like to analyze and research further in this uh, matter. Our next steps are further uh, dependency trials, where we also would like to, uh, to purposely add uh, such contaminations like polycarbonate and glue in order to find out uh, what the uh, what the cleaning performance of the of the LSP is, yeah? and finally, we also would like to do a migration test of this uh, of these uh, bottles. Yeah, but is there much is there much more to go? Is there already? Is there much more to go? Go. Uh, I have five more slides, but I can go very quickly too. Yeah? If you would, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here you can see our uh, bottle to bottle process. So we are going with pre drying and or a crystallizer in a single or twin screw extruder, depending on the uh, moisture content and the bulk density. So to compensate bulk density and humidity is more or less uh, our, our part, what we take care and what we can handle by design the system accordingly. Yeah. Uh, we already hear from Casper uh, some uh, some price information. I don't think I need to tell here a lot of them. Uh, we, when we take a, a look back uh, two years, the price difference between Virgin and Arpet pellet was only 100 euro per ton. Since last year, we have 650 or right now 550 euro per ton. So this is for sure a challenge uh, also for for the market, the good thing is that the uh, that the legislation and also the brand owners will uh, stick on their announcements, and in order to achieve the recycled content in the pellets, and and to achieve the recycled content, uh, the, the the recycled target of the bottles, in order to to push this market on to to move forward again. Uh, a similar picture what uh, what we also saw in the first presentation in a, in another another design so i will not go uh, deeper deeper here it's also the the uh, it shows the lack of harmonization let's say in in uh, return deposit system in different european countries in order to achieve the target of 77% uh, uh, collection rate in 2025, some of these countries for sure have to have to do something here. Uh, I additionally add here 
the current collection rate from the USA with 28% right now. So also here we have a big potential and a big market where we, the potential is given to, to get some more material here. If you further want to uh, improve the, the efficiency of recycling, as I said in the beginning, you can go direct from LSB reactor to injection molding process. There is a huge uh, saving potential in investment of more than 1 mil million euro and also a uh, reduction of the energy saving of more than 0.3 kilowatt hour per kilogram in total from the uh, mechanical recycling to the uh, injection molding uh, part. Yeah, this was uh, more or less my presentation. Why he reacts recycling for the future because of uh, the best in glass cleaning efficiency, extremely low energy consumption and unique the IV controllable system. So IV is not only uh, measurable in the system, it's also uh, permanent and uh, controllable. Yeah, that's why. That are the reasons why PET recycling is going more and more liquid. Thank you very much. And sorry to, to have uh, overtime, I guess. Okay, Over thank you, here. David. Sorry I had to rush you, but we yeah. have got a, a time limit. And uh, yes, the, the people who are um, coming to, to, to watch are uh, also have their time limitations as well. Uh, thank, you. thank you, that was very, very thorough. And we have a couple of questions for you later. We'll go straight on now to Dr. Bruno Longlois, Business Development and Partnership Director at Carbios. He's a graduate of Clarkson University, in New York, although I didn't realize that. Uh, one thing I, I do know already is that he is very passionate about innovations uh, and novel technical solutions. And what he is going to talk about is unlocking advanced biorecycling of PET and the future of chemical recycling markets. Bruno? I hand over to you. Thank you for this introduction. And <clears throat> let me take a bit of uh, time to uh, uh, expose the technology and also try to catch up so we have more time for the questions. So as you and thanks also for the presentation that have been made so far. So it's a complimentary presentation to uh, recycling PT. Uh, as Casper mentioned today, the norm is about mechanical recycling. Um, Complementary technology will be about uh, a broadly term used to uh, chemical recycling, but uh, for the PET, it's more a depolymerization, so breaking down the molecules to its primary constituents uh, that will be used. And let me go through a couple of slides to introduce that to you. First of all, um, a few words about Carbius. So Carbius is a young company, uh, it's founded in 2011. We are a little bit over 100 employees today in an, uh, and we continue to hire people as we are building a plant uh, that will be operational in 2025. So uh, hiring uh, more industrial uh, people, but however, uh, today we still have a lot of resources uh, dedicated to the research. About 65% of our population is still working on solutions for the end of life of plastics because Carbio's core business is to develop enzymes. Enzymes are used as a catalyst and as we have enzyme in our body, so enzyme is a protein, uh, enzymes are very useful uh, to do some uh, chemical reactions that can be either make more materials or break down materials, and that's why we are using them. So it's a research. We have a lot of IP being taken. We have over 85 patents on technologies. Today, we have one technology to help to biodegrade PLA in compostable uh, home compost situations. And we are working on PET and other polymers as well. We are operating from three sites. Uh, all our operations are in Clermont-Ferrand, in the center of France. Clermont-Ferrand is well known because it's Michelin uh, tire company headquarters. This is what we are doing there. We have our administrative, we have our development uh, center, we have uh, our pilot units and demonstration units. So these are terms that we cover later on. We do our upstream research in uh, conjunction with the Toulouse Bio Institute. Uh, in, so in Toulouse, uh, this is where we develop enzymes. So Carbios uh, is to engineer enzymes, these proteins that are being used. And there we have a lot of tools, high throughput technologies, characterizations, 3D modeling. So that helps to uh, define uh, the right enzyme to break down plastics. And at last but not least, uh, Lon-Laville, it's in North 
east of France, very close to Luxembourg, close to the Benelux and Germany and France. This is where will be our plant, uh, the 50,000 ton plants that we are building as we speak. Just to have, uh, for the sake of clarity, what do we mean here by uh, chemical recycling, depolymerization, pyrolysis, mechanical recycling, and so on. So if you look a little bit at the different uh, use of plastics today, we are very familiar with the non circular pathways where you make material from crude oil feedstock all the way to plastic that you transform to objects that could be a, a plastic bag, a bottle, uh, textile as well. You have a lot of plastics. Then at the end of their life, this material is typically thrown away because plastic is very cheap to make very, very efficient, uh, very cheap to make and uh, give a lot of uh, benefits, but then uh, the recycling path have not been developed so far, or at least marginally. And then typically uh, those wastes are burned or uh, landfilled. Uh, when they are burned, we try to recover the energy out of the combustion of the plastics because they are made of carbons. However, uh, recently we have developed some, uh, some ways to use our plastic with the mechanical recycling, and you see a lot of technologies that have been developed to do this. And here, when you look at mechanical recycling from a chemical perspective, you basically take the polymer that have been made, and you melt it, and you reshape it, trying to preserve the properties as much as you can. It works very well with uh, a single uh, uh, streams. So, for instance, 100% PET is very, it's easy to uh, to make. You have, of course, to take care of contaminations issues, which have been developed so far. And uh, you you go back to uh, to this. This is a very efficient way of doing it because you you use a little energy to melt the polymer and reshape it. If you want to go one step further, and that's what Cabell's technology is about, you're going to break down the polymer here to make PET. Typically, the industry is using two monomers, one called PTA, acid terephthalic, and the other one called monoethylene glycol. And if you break down the PET into these two monomers, and you have other ways to break down the, mo the, the molecule, you can use other solvents. But here with Scabius, we are using water. And when we break down in water, you've got the PTA and the MEG, which is what 97% of the polymerization unit. So the people who have virgin plastics today, they use PT and MEG coming from crude oil to make the PET. So what Cabios is doing is to break down PET and give back the PT and the MEG. And this PT and the MEG can go back to a polymerization unit and get a virgin-like plastics. And that's what is important, is that you go back to a virgin state. What is not as good, of course, but is that you don't you have to use a little bit more energy to do that because you break down and then you need to remake. And at last but not least, in terms of understanding what the whole uh, the whole uh, recycling technologies are about, then you have the pyrolysis and gasification, which is a little bit uh, higher temperature, where you go back basically to a, a kind of raw material. Here we are talking of pyrolysis oil. You burn the plastic without oxygen and you get uh, uh, some crude oil uh, that you need to mix again in some proportion with the uh, virgin material because the quality of the oil is not exactly what you will get uh, a full spectrum of oil and then you go back to uh, you go back to uh, to uh, uh, plastics by going back to the monomer and so on. you need to use much more energy and one of course of the issues as well you have here is that you need to mix this with fossil oil and uh, you have a concept of mass balance that needs to be addressed because you don't have the tools at the scale and the technology at the scale you need to have for that. So that's the overview of the technology. Uh, so what Cabios, uh, key message for Cabios technology. First of all, we are going to treat waste today that are not easy to recycle. So the clear bottles, uh, mechanical recycling is appropriate for that. When we talk about uh, non-food grade material, when we talk about color objects, when we talk about textile, these are feedstock that Cabios technology can take on board and that will increase the circularity of the material. We can also take the material which are contaminated or the fines or the rejects or mechanical recycler as well. They are extremely good feedstock. In a nutshell, we need to have a high content of PT from an economical perspective, but the depolymerization will take care of the PET and everything else, especially when you use an enzyme which is very selective, will be just left out, will become an ultimate waste. But the enzyme is doing the extra sorting that we need to have for a complex mixture of plastics. 
So that gave additional value that enhanced the circularity and also for materials today that we don't know how to recycle. And uh, as sorry, I need to go back one stop because there was a last comment I wanted to make. Of course, we all do that to make sure that our CO2 emissions are under control, which is a prime target. And the Carbios process has to be uh, making sure that uh, when you compare the production of one kilogram of virgin plastics and one kilogram of PET produced using waste, uh, you don't emit much. You don't emit uh, more and more CO2 than uh, using fossil uh, fossil energy. And then, of course, you can take credits for the end of life of the material that you diverted from uh, incineration in landfill. And this is the case for Carbios technology. Uh, I wanted just to give uh, a couple of uh, information about uh, what we are meaning by that. So key, key takeaways, you take a polymer, it's going to be in water. That's interesting for Carbio's process because the material we are trying to recycle, whether that textile or packaging, they're usually not soluble in water. So you take a, a piece of material which is not soluble in water, the enzyme is going to cut it down. And uh, we are putting ourselves in conditions where this enzyme, which is a catalyst, it's a bit like a lock and a key, so very selective. So uh, you can think about a simple image. Both we have, a, all of us have an apartment. It's very unlikely that uh, the key of my apartment opens the lock of your apartments and vice versa. So this is pretty much what the enzyme is doing. It's going to only take care of the PET. Everything else will be left out. It's insoluble material. They will be eliminated early in the process. And then we will have the monomers going into the water phase and we will separate those monomers, the PTA and the MEG, to reproduce uh, material of uh, high purity. They can be then transformed by polymerization uh, companies like uh, Indorama and the like, Equipolymer, uh, to make again uh, a virgin plastics. This technology, if you want to learn a bit more about, is being published in 2020 uh, in the magazine Nature, in the scientific publication Nature, made the front page. It's also technology that has been labeled by, um, by Solar Impulse. So technology there, and the major achievement we made is that we are capable of breaking down 97% of the PET in less than 20 hours. So which means that now we have something that we can industrialize at large scales. And that was the major achievement that we make in 2020. Um, now, where we are today, and that's the other uh, message, okay? We are all anxious. We have heard about this advanced technology to recycle PET, and we still talk a lot about the mechanical recycling. So where do we stand on this? So complementary technology, interesting. Carbios is now working at uh, a demonstration unit. What is a demonstration unit? It's the same, it's a mini plant. It has the same equipment of a large scale plant, and it's just used to generate uh, process design package uh, data, process industrialization data, so we can license the technology. The objective of Carbios is to license the technology to make monomers that can be transformed back into virgin plastics. And our prime target is, of course, the PET producers, because they will now start, they have the capabilities to make virgin-like PET using waste instead of using crude oil. Uh, industrialization, usually when you talk biotechnology, biotech people think that uh, it's quite complex, not for enzymes, because enzymes are just proteins. They are not living organism. They are produced by living organism, but they are just a protein, and the protein is very stable. The one we have developed is very stable. So you take plastics or textile, you expose it. It's a catalyst, so it's used as a fraction of a percent. And within 24 hours, you will degrade. Uh, you will degrade all the plastics, the PET uh, present in the system. So the PET is added to the waste. Sorry, the enzyme is added to the waste. Sorry for this confusion. The enzyme is added to the waste, and within 24 hours, you have within 24 hours you broke down all the PET present and then you purified to get the monomers. Cabios is uh, finalizing its uh, process uh, design package to license the technology, but also uh, working on building a first of a kind plant uh, that will be owned by Cabios. Uh, we have uh, a partner to do that. And the idea here is to uh, demonstrate at the industrial scale and also make sure that our future licensee We'll have all the tools necessary 
uh, to run the plants. So the first of the kind, the first of a kind plant uh, has been uh, has been developed by uh, sorry is um, is being built uh, with a partner uh, in Dorama. Uh, in northeast of France, so Indorama has a site over there that uh, we will get uh, acquisition part of their lands. We'll build this plant. We will produce the monomer. We will purify the monomer, and then the monomers will be transformed into um, into a PT, virgin PT, by Indorama. It's an important partner. Indorama is the number one uh, PT producer, and uh, we will be uh, will be operating in 2025. This is a, also an important step for Carbios. Uh, 2025, it start to make uh, monomer sales. Uh, we will uh, be able to develop some uh, volumes for our brand owners. We have been working in partnerships uh, with the key brand owners to validate the technology of Carbios was suitable. We had two consortium. Uh, we have two consortium working on that. One is dedicated to the packaging. We have companies like L'Oreal, PepsiCo, um, Nestle. Uh, century uh, that have validated our technology in terms of uh, uh, making the same packaging as the one they have been using. And also we did a lot of migration tests, a lot of uh, uh, regulatory uh, developments with them. Uh, we have a partner to manufacture the industry, uh, the enzyme at the industrial uh, scale. We have a long term partner called Novozymes, is a leader in the production of enzymes. So Carbios developed the sequence to make the enzyme and Novozyme will industrialize that part. This is something that we didn't need to do. And uh, at the end, of course, uh, with this plan running, it will give uh, it will give possibility to uh, future licensees to uh, develop their, their technology and run their plants uh, in conjunction with what uh, Carbios has been doing uh, with his uh, first plant. If you want to uh, get uh, 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 in a nutshell or quite quickly what Carbios is, uh, is offering, what the technology is offering, uh, first of all, it's what we call a plug and play. Uh, you make monomers which are used today by uh, the PET manufacturer, so you don't need to reconstruct um, this part of the value chain. We are capable of taking care of uh, broadened waste types here. I'm talking about um, complex packagings. Uh, textile also will be available, and that's in important steps because you will have more feedstock to work with. We are increasing the circularity per industry. We can take uh, food grade, non-food grade uh, materials and transform them back into packaging that can be food grade. Uh, and textile to textile, which is an important thing, because today we have a lot of uh, uh, PET bottles recycling that are used to make a textile, but we know it's not sustainable on the long way. We are enhancing the circularity because you can have more loops as you go back to virgin state every time without the exception of losing material like in any industrial process. You could do it infinitely. We go back to a virgin like material and we are solvent free and this is important. Um, two things here, we are using water. Uh, water is a pretty friendly solvent, so you, solvent, so you don't need to have uh, extra equipment to uh, maintain or confine uh, the solvents. And uh, enzymes are working at quite low temperature. We are working at 65 degrees, so in terms of temperature, we don't need to have uh, uh, high temperature equipments. We also uh, work at atmospheric pressure, so uh, we have uh, a quite uh, important, uh, we don't need to invest in uh, high pressure equipment. And then with the exception of uh, crystallizing at the end the PTA, uh, but it's just one part of the process. The whole part of the process is done at uh, atmospheric pressure. And uh, we use an enzyme and the enzyme is very selective, so it's not uh, taking care, it's not doing uh, anything to the other materials that are just eliminated, as I said, at the very early part of the process. And the enzyme is pretty robust. So the enzyme is not being impacted by any contaminants. And that's what's part of the work we have done with our consortium people. We have tried a lot of contaminants, whether they are uh, additives such as uh, UV blocker, oxygen scavengers, any kind of dyes. We had very uh, funny dyes like fluorescent bottles and so on. 
typical glues that you could find. Uh, we have tested against uh, uh, PA, polyamide, uh, nylon, when you have nylon in bottles, PVC. Uh, to some extent, PVC is more a problem with the corrosion issues, but it's not a problem with uh, the enzymes. Uh, we have looked at uh, P, P, uh, P, 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 and so on. So most of the material we can find in the packagings uh, do not affect the enzyme, pretty robust enzyme. By the way, this enzyme is very stable even in high temperature, above 100 degrees, which is quite unusual for an enzyme. And um, I wanted to say that uh, at least uh, we looked at uh, the material, the, the point number six, we looked at the material we'd be using uh, for our plants in Long La Ville. So it would be a mix of uh, colored flakes and food trays. We want to increase the recyclability of the food trays. And if you take a mix, so the plant will be built in France. So if you take the mix of energy, uh, the way we are going to source our feedstock and the way that these kind of waste are processed uh, in France and in Danelux, because we'll be using a mix of the two regions, then you you will uh, you will save 51 percent of CO2 emission when you take into account uh, the end of the life of this uh, of these materials that they are uh, happening today. So to conclude. Uh, to take the takeaways from this presentation. So we have a, a team today which is supported by key leaders. I'm also saying that in the textile industry, uh, this is the next step for us. We want to keep in mind that today, uh, PET, one third goes to the packaging, but two third is going to the textile. So we have big challenge in, uh, in the textile. So we have, uh, we have partners as well in the textile industry. We have uh, partnered with uh, Patagonia, uh, Salomon, on. Puma and PVH, which is better known under Calvin Klein and Tommel Filger, to address the textile issues. Uh, we have a demonstration plan today, which is running and which has which is capable of producing uh, the PTA and the MEG I just mentioned before, with the quality of uh, needed to remake um, polymers. And uh, we are on track to build our plants that will be commissioned at the end of 2025. We'll start and ramp up. And uh, we are finalizing our process packaging to license our technology uh, this year. And we are working on projects today to have more than one plant uh, running around the world. I was a little bit quick from what I understand, but I wanted to leave more time for the questions. So I hope, uh, Rari, you appreciate that. <laughs> I certainly do. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. I very much appreciate it, Bruno. Um, I'm going to start with a question for you, and it's from me, actually, because biorecycling has a bit of a, a reputation for maybe not being as um, you know, squeaky clean as we would like a recycling process to be. So there are concerns about waste and outflow used in the process. Now, can your enzymes be reused or, you know, can they ultimately be got rid of without damaging the environment? You know, just making sure that the cure isn't worse than the disease. <laughs> OK, yes. Yeah. So a couple of questions about the enzymes. So an enzymes, as I said, is a protein. OK, and we are producing enzymes every day. So it's not it's it's made of the amino acids. And what is fantastic is that all living organism on the planet are of the same 20 amino acids which are available to make enzymes. We all do the same. We are not necessarily manufacturing all of them. We're not necessarily using all of them, but that's the same materials. The enzyme today is a catalyst, so it's used as a fraction of a percent, so difficult to recover, even if majority of it will be absorbed on remaining plastics at the end of the process. But we simply denature the enzyme at the end. So the protein, we denature the proteins by giving it an alkali uh, acid treatment. So we go back to uh, amino acids, and again, it's a fraction of a percent. All right, thank you for that. Now, um, Tom Brady, who I think is in the United States, asked what, uh, and I'm putting it this to you first, uh, but you know, everybody else can come in and, and answer as well. Mixing biodegradable plastics with standard PET, is that something that you do? And what is the impact, or, or really, should it be done separately as, as far as your, your process is concerned? So for, for Cabio's process, uh, the, the biodegradable plastics, whether they are PBT, P, polylactic acid, this is the two I have in mind, but they might be, there are many others. They are not, they are typical, they are the same as a petrol source uh, chemistry for us. For the enzyme, they are simply molecules that are not 
that the enzyme cannot break down. So they are not affected. And typically, they are not soluble in water as well. So they will be considered as PPPA and other material for us. Okay. Not right. I think I understand. I'm, uh, okay, I think I understand that. I'm not an expert. I don't know if you've noticed. Okay, um, Zhou Dong, I think your question has been answered by David Ehrenberger. If not, do please come back and say. Now, um, somebody called Kay. Um, question, you mentioned the higher energy consumption of the process. Does it mean it is not efficient for now? No, I said higher consumption means uh, it's all relative terms. But today uh -huh. uh, we did uh, we have a full LCNR uh, for our first plan. So today, Carbios process will emit a bit less, but I would say in the same order of magnitudes because this is always the same uh, as CO two to produce one kilogram of virgin plastics. This is the reference. This is the unit we are using when you make LCA. We use will emit as much CO two to make one kilogram of plastics from waste. And I mentioned the waste, it's a mix of colored flakes and food trays. Then the emission of CO2 that are being uh, emitted today to produce the same kilogram of virgin like plastics using petrochemistry. So it's all relative. I was saying that the go, the more you are going on the left side of the slide, of course, the more energy you need. But today making virgin plastics from fossil energy has a contribution of 2.19 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of plastics mm -hmm. uh, manufactured. And we are exactly in the same range. So very efficient to go back to a virgin quality plastics. All right. OK, thank you. Uh, Michael Kirch asks, is the enzyme added to the polymer or only to the solution when decomposing the PET in the reactor? And are there ingredients in the PET that hinder or deactivate the enzyme activity, such as colorants and additives? Does, does it, something get in the way? OK, so the enzyme is added uh, in the water phase during the depolymerization, uh, where you control the temperature and the pH of the solution, so for the chemist. And uh, we did not find any, for the packaging, we didn't find any uh, material that could deactivate the enzymes. We're still working for the textile part, where you know textile is a little bit more creative in terms of the added materials. Uh, you have much more complex materials uh, uh, that you don't find in, a, in the packaging industry, including non-food contact materials. So I'm not saying that we may not find some material that has uh, inhibition on the, on the enzyme, but today for the packaging, it was not the case. Okay. All right, that's great. Thank you. Uh, I've, I'm now being asked to ask Paul Needle and David Herrenberger, uh, Paul of Starlinger and David of uh, NGR, the same question about biodegradable plastics. Uh, adding biodegradable plastics to the uh, to the mix when you're looking to recycle, can you do it? First of all, uh, if not, what are the what are the problems? Paul, okay. Um... We didn't simulate that so far, but I think the question really um, refers to uh, biodegradable and not bio-based. So um, bio-based uh, is of course no problem, but uh, biodegradable, um, even though we didn't simulate that, but I would expect that it doesn't do any good to the to the polymer because in the polymer, I mean, I'm pretty sure we can recycle it, but then you have a mixture of uh, a standard polymer with a biodegradable polymer, so you would compromise um, the quality of the of the chip. That's right. my take okay. on it. All right, thank you, David. Would you uh, agree, or have you got a different perspective on it? No, I I, I will agree with Paul. I think uh, biodegradable uh, plastics are not made for mechanical recycling. That's why they're biodegradable. So there was also not the request to us to to have uh, tests and. Uh, also, the amount for is, is is not here, so we do not have the experience to answer uh, this question exactly. But uh, I expect the same answer, so it will not uh, having any goods to to the properties of this material when you put them through the extrusion process. Okay, uh, and David, thank you for answering for answering those questions that popped up in the chat. Um, okay, now uh, right. Sorry, yeah, that there's a there are some questions that I wanted to just oh right, here we are. 
sorry about that. I just misplaced a couple of questions. Um, now, for NGR particularly, David, how far has the process of LSP and direct processing of pet flakes progressed? Um, LSP, I'll just check. That's liquid. Um, you remind me. Condensation. Thank you. So how far has the process of LSP and direct processing of PET flakes progressed? Are we talking about a pilot project with a Husky system or is the principle already transferable to, to scale, to broad, to commercial level? Yeah. Uh, we have we have one prototype at in Bolton, Canada. It's a 500 kilogram uh, line. This can be used for any tr trials or tests. Yeah, uh, we have one commercial line which will be delivered in the next month to Asia, and a second one uh, is also on the way. Yeah, let's say so. And both commercial lines are for a capacity of one ton per hour. A ton per one ton per hour. Yeah, one ton per hour. Yeah. OK, that's good. Thank you. Um, Paul, where does Starlinger see potential markets for PET recycling at the moment and how are they developing into the future? And could you please briefly mention or uh, discuss the advantages of the newly designed pre-drying unit and the extruder? But that's two questions. Uh, <laughs> first of one was, what? how do you see the potential markets for PET recycling at the moment and in the future? I would have to ask um, uh, David to close his ears, ears now, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's not a secret. I mean, the um, the last two years have been like really dynamic globally. Um, the last, I would really say in the last two years, it's very hard for me to say, okay, uh, this, uh, this geographically area versus another one, it was everywhere successful in each continent. Um, now it's a bit different, um, and I think this is also not a surprise to most of the listeners here. Uh, Europe is slowing a little bit down, US is slowing a little mm -hmm. bit down. Um, biggest potential at the moment is uh, in uh, some parts of Asia and in Africa. Right, I've got another question for, for NGR for David. Don't go away, Bruno, I've got one for you as well coming up. Um, David. After your cleaning process, a very small amount of contamination remains in the material. When the material is recycled several times, can these substances accumulate? And if they do, what are the solutions? Yeah, so each each recycling process will influence the properties of the of the material for sure in terms of color and, and different degradation mechanisms. But uh, to be honest, we never tested uh, the same material a couple of times. Uh, so uh, there is no really an, an answer to, to, to give. But anyway, for uh, the general application, I really recommend to have always to have never this 100% RPET bottles in order to uh, have always a, a bit of virgin in, in the in the material stream, I prefer to have 50, 50, 70, 30 percent uh, mixtures for uh, the bottle to bottle application. OK, all right. Um, now, uh, Bruno, a question for you. Yours, the mechanical uh, bio recycling process is different from the, me from, uh, the mechanical uh, recycling process. Now, is it competitive with the mechanical um, recycling process? And if it is competitive, will these will these two actually sort of be competing with and take th things from each other, maybe damage each, each other's businesses? Um, you know, in the past, we've, we, we, it has been said that textiles, for example, don't play a role in the recycling of pet bottles and that the applications can rely on different feedstocks. But if you're all looking at the same feedstock, then will a material war develop between the different processes? Well, I, I think oh, you just I don't gave expect a, guns in the high street. Uh, that, no, that don't sort worry, of, but, don't know. worry, uh, and this will not happen. And uh, you partially gave the the assumptions is not correct. So we are not playing with the same feedstock, because okay. of course, if you look at clear bottles. Uh, it's better to recycle them mechanically unless you have a yellowing or you have some uh, some contamination in your feedstock. So we are really targeting uh, feedstock today that we cannot uh, recycle recycle thermomechanically. 
So we are looking at uh, non-food grade materials that you would like to transform into food grade materials or which have been contaminated, uh, non-food grade contaminated with food grade. We are looking at colored material. We are looking at, uh, as I said, food trays mixed with other uh, an EVA film or PA film. So these are materials that you cannot recycle today. And of course, majority of the developments will also be done on the textile side. The good thing is that after you have depolymerized, you can decide whatever stream you want, whatever polymer you want to make. So you can make, uh, and we've done the exercise, you can take a t-shirt and make a clear bottle with your t-shirts the other way around, actually. Because then, of course, you get the purity of the monomers uh, the purity of the monomers, you have, uh, you know, I mean, everybody says, oh, how is it possible? But crude oil is not a material we would like to take a sip off. So we are capable of making food grade from crude oil, food grade material mm. from crude oil. We are capable of making with purification steps. We go to 99.9 and you can go uh, several, you can go a couple of decimals after that. Uh, purity uh, using, uh, using this kind of uh, feedstock. So we are not competing on the same feedstock. That's the beginning of the answer. We are complementary. We are we 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 will probably, uh, and this is something we are working with Indorama, by the way, because they are also doing some thermo thermomechanical recycling. Is that we are complementary technology to their rejects to the material they cannot recycle thermomechanically. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to have to stop it now because we've run out of time. We've run out of our session on the uh, on on the satellite or whatever it is or the cable. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you all for your questions, Tom Brady. I'm sorry we couldn't say that last question of yours looked like a good one. I uh, hope we'll be able to get get it answered offline. Thanks to everybody for coming along. To Bruno, to David, to Paul, and to Casper who uh, st started the session and to all the participants, especially those who, who put the interesting questions to us. I think this has been particularly interesting. I'm enlightened. I often am, but I'm even more than usual. Thanks a lot and I'll see you again next time. Bye bye now. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. bye.